During the Nintendo 64 era, Rare was on top of the world. They were still riding high on the success of their Donkey Kong Country series and had recently introduced their most famous IP, Banjo-Kazooie. This game was both a major critical and financial success, but also cemented their image as a developer of games that all ages could enjoy. While they had developed less family-friendly titles like Killer Instinct, GoldenEye 007, and Perfect Dark, Banjo-Kazooie and another rare platformer, Donkey Kong 64, became the type of game that most people expected from the British company. But in 2001, they released a game that nobody could have seen coming. A team of developers at Rare had been stuck trying to make their latest project work, and they went against the grain to release something that went against their child-friendly image. They created a mature, offensive, crude, and off-color game that almost seemed out of place next to the rest of their library. It was foul-mouthed, gory, sexual, and mean-spirited as hell, and people absolutely loved it. Today we're examining how Rare took an innocent little platformer and retooled it into a mature romp through the darker side of humor, and why many people see it as one of the company's masterpieces. This is Conker's Bad Fur Day. In 1997, Rare released Diddy Kong Racing, a kart racer that starred Diddy Kong and his friends as they raced each other in carts, planes, and hoverboats to fight the evil wizard Whizpig. Not only is it a well-loved kart racer, but it's also notable for introducing two characters who would star in upcoming titles, Banjo the Bear, whose game Banjo-Kazooie would be released in 1998, and Conquer the Squirrel. This guy was the lead role in two games in development at Rare, a 3D collectathon platformer for the Nintendo 64 and a 2D collectathon adventure game for the Game Boy and Game Boy Color. The latter was eventually released as Conker's Pocket Tales in 1999 on a dual format cartridge and it starred Conker rescuing his girlfriend Barry after the evil Acorn kidnaps her and steals Conker's birthday presents. I've already gone over this game in a previous video, which you can watch here, but suffice to say it was ultimately forgotten compared to the company's Nintendo 64 titles, as you might expect. The N64 game, on the other hand, started development under the name Conker's Quest and was introduced at E3 1997 alongside Banjo-Kazooie, a game that evolved from its previous iteration as an RPG for the Super Nintendo, codenamed Project Dream. Conker's quest centered around Conker the Squirrel and his girlfriend Barry as they traveled around the large world and collected various items, basically identical to Super Mario 64 and what Banjo-Kazooie became. While both Conker and Banjo were under development at the same time, they were being handled by two separate teams in the company. In fact, the Project's Dream staff were brought in at one point to observe the Conker team's progress, which would then influence Banjo's development. The next year, the Conker Project was shown off once again at E3, now under the title 12 Tales Conker 64. While the demonstration received generally good reviews, there were also concerns that Rare was banking too much on the same gameplay style and cutesy visual aesthetic as Banjo-Kazooie. This worried Rare internally as well, and not helping was the fact that development on the game wasn't going smoothly. The team had several ideas ironed out, but the game wasn't coming together, and it seemed like it would be quietly cancelled. That is, until Chris Seaver stepped up. He was an artist on 12 Tales who had gotten his start with the company on Killer Instinct, and as development of the Conquer project fell apart, Seaver pitched an idea to Rare founders Tim and Chris Stamper about a game called Conquer's Bad Fur Day. The game would star Conker trying to help other characters in the world, but inadvertently making their problems worse, and Seaver wanted the game to have more of an edge, giving Conker a tougher personality and making the adventure darker and more violent. The Stampers approved of the idea, making Seaver the project lead and tasking him with overhauling the game, and the first thing the team did was create the Beehive section, which takes place early in the final game. Tim Stamper had the idea of Conker retrieving a beehive from angry wasps and delivering it to a bee queen, but Seaver saw that there was no in-game justification for doing so and no reward besides another collectible. So Seaver implanted a scene where the beehive transformed into a machine gun and the bee queen shot the wasps to death, adding an unexpected twist that was more satisfying than just ticking off a box on the player's checklist. The Stampers loved what Seaver and the team had done with the level, and this shaped how the rest of the game's sequences would come together. 
Thus, Seaver and the rest of the developers, including programmers Mark Betteridge, Chris Marlowe, and Sean Pyle, artists Don Murphy, animators Declan Doyle and Luis O'Connor, and audio designer Robin Beanland, got to work on the rest of the game. Dialogue was improvised as the designers came up with new scenarios for the game, and unlike how games are usually made, a story segment would be designed first before the corresponding gameplay segment. Focusing on the story and the comedy helped the team come up with unique concepts for levels and story beats, and was also a major reason why the final product contains so many profane elements. According to Don Murphy, the Rare developers had proven themselves more than capable by this point, so both the higher-ups at the company and Nintendo were fine with the game-changing direction. You might be surprised to learn that Nintendo kept most of the game intact, only requesting a few jokes be removed. They rejected a cutscene that featured an off-screen Pikachu almost being attacked with a baseball bat, and weren't happy with the splash screen where Conker saws the N64 logo in half, but this was ultimately kept in. The retooled game was announced in 2000, with many assuming it to be an April Fool's Day prank, but Rare and Nintendo of America were both fully committed to pushing the new game out. There were some uproars about the raucous content, KB Toys refused to sell the game, and the game had to be published by THQ in Europe because Nintendo of Europe refused to do so, but otherwise the gaming world was excited to give this new version of Conquer a try. However, Nintendo applied a careful approach to market it correctly to prevent parents from buying the game thinking that it was for kids. The company ensured that an adult-only warning was pasted onto the box and the marketing materials, and Nintendo only displayed advertisements in adult magazines like Playboy and Maxim. This, along with the game releasing late in the N64's lifespan, led to Conker's Bad Fur Day selling way below expectations and ultimately becoming a commercial disappointment. Despite poor sales, it was lauded by both critics and players, especially because of its humor, dialogue, technical achievements, and gameplay, and it remains a cult classic and a favorite among Rare fans. So, how does the game hold up 20 years later, and what makes the game stand out among other games of its era? Let's find out. Conker's Bad Fur Day begins with the titular squirrel sitting atop a throne, explaining via narration that he is the king of all the land. He begins to tell the tale of how he came to this position, which begins the day prior, as Conker has one too many at a bar and stumbles out in a drunken stupor, ending up in an unfamiliar location. Meanwhile, the fabled Panther King is enjoying a glass of milk in his throne room when his table, which is missing a leg, tips over and shatters his glass, which sends the King into a rage. The King tasks Professor Von Krippelspack, a weasel scientist, with fixing the problem, and the Professor comes up with a simple solution, find the Red Squirrel and use him to replace the table leg. However, it soon becomes clear that the Professor has other intentions, and is currently working on perfecting a race of evil teddy bear monsters named Teddies for an unknown but certainly villainous purpose. Elsewhere, Conker wakes up in the middle of a field hung over and unsure of where he is, and he prepares himself as his bad fur day begins. Conker controls as you'd expect if you've ever played a 3D platformer like this one, albeit with some slight movement quirks. You can move around and jump, and Conker also has a funny helicoptery tail thing, which allows him to hover in the air before descending, letting you cross large gaps with ease. It can also save you from tall jumps, which is great because the height at which Conker takes fall damage is very low, and taking a big enough spill will make you explode into a bloody, chunky mess. Conker can also crouch down, and from this state you can either crawl or perform a crouch jump to gain extra height. You can also attack enemies with a frying pan that Conker swings out in front of him, but I find it pretty unwieldy to use. For the most part, you won't actually use it to damage foes, instead using it to knock out non-hostile objects so you can then pick them up. Outside the basic movement, Conker has a wide range of abilities that run the gamut from advanced weapons to using plot-required items. The amount of things you can do is astounding, because the developers didn't limit it to repeatable techniques that the player is expected to learn, and yet Bad Fur Day is still very simple thanks to a brilliant gameplay concept, the context-sensitive buttons. These are buttons that are sensitive to context, meaning that if you press B on one, it will provide Conker with a tool necessary to complete an objective, whether through a cutscene or a separate gameplay mechanic. Each button has a specific function, allowing the designers to get more creative with Conker's moveset, and therefore more creative with the scenarios and puzzles that the player can encounter. 
Condensing the game's controls through segmented gameplay portions opens up the floodgates for essentially endless possibilities. It's not like games today that have tons of commands for moves and functions, but have to work around the limitations of a controller with not enough buttons to assign just one task to everything. Rare found a way to integrate all the gameplay ideas naturally while also commenting on the nature of context-sensitive actions, an essential part of just about any video game that's represented literally in Conquer. Bad Fur Day features a large world that's alternatively sprawling and compact depending on where you are. While the game is separated into nine distinct areas that are segmented from each other, the transitions between each level are more subtle than they are in Banjo-Kazooie and DK64. Interestingly, the levels change in their core design as the game progresses. While the first three chapters are very open, allowing for a wide freedom of movement through the stage, every other world is more linear, taking you from one portion of the level to the next as you move on. Objectives typically take place in a defined sequence, as finishing one task usually opens up the next part of the stage. Many of the tasks feel just like things you do in Banjo or DK64, only with a surprise that's distinctly dark and twisted, like collecting cheats for a hungry mouse only for him to violently explode, or fighting a boiler boss that happens to have two giant brass testicles. Bad Fur Day isn't a collectathon. in fact, the only main collectibles are bundles of cash, which are typically waiting at the end of a level or section. The only function of the money is to open up locked gates that lead to new areas, essentially serving the same purpose as Jiggies and Golden Bananas. You're going to have to collect basically every wad of cash to beat the game, which means you will see all the cutscenes, but it also removes the freedom you have in Banjo-Tooie and DK64 in terms of which tasks you go for. The only other things you can pick up are pieces of anti-gravity chocolate to restore Conker's health, and squirrel's tails to give you an extra life. You can't actually collect the tails until you've died for the first time, at which point you meet Greg the Grim Reaper, who introduces the concept of lives in another parody of video game mechanics. That's something I love about Conker, how it pulls out traditional gaming conventions that we've all more or less accepted as just things that happen, like extra lives, health pickups that float in the air, and zones that change what functions buttons have, and applies an in-universe logic to them. Curiously, Conker's overall objective design also changes throughout the game as later levels get more and more complex. For the first two-thirds or so, Bad Fur Day is largely a parody and deconstruction of 3D platformers, making fun of a lot of tropes prevalent in these types of games, including Rare's own library. Hungover is your basic tutorial level, giving a quick introduction to Conker's basic movement and controls before setting you loose. You can't die here, and the level is designed to guide you through comfortably, starting with a section where Conker can barely walk and ending with Conker learning how to attack enemies. The second chapter, Windy, acts as the game's hub world, as every other chapter is accessed from this area and you'll be revisiting it multiple times. It's a large level that contains a number of objectives and side areas, and it features a fantastically catchy song that has several variations that fade into each other based on where you are. Barn Boys is very much a banjo level turned on its head and put through a grinder, as the cheery barn exterior peels away and reveals a darker core. It contains a lot of memorable sections like the Terminator Haystack, dealing with Frankie the Pitchfork, and a more infamous example, getting a sunflower to reveal her big breasts so a homeless bee can pollinate her. I've never liked the fourth chapter, Bat's Tower, not only because it's a very vertical level, which I'm not a fan of, but also because a lot of its jokes don't land for me or have not aged well. Oddly enough, I don't mind the swimming sections too much, since the swimming controls aren't even that bad. I just find a lot of the platforming out of the water to be infuriating. Sloprano takes place on a giant mountain made of poop, and if that doesn't give you an idea of the humor you get in this game, I don't know what will. There's not much to this area, but it does contain perhaps the most memorable section, the boss fight against the Great Mighty Pooh, a huge turd monster that sings opera as you fight him. Me, 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 me. I am the Great Mighty Pooh, and I'm going to throw my shit at you. Sloprano leads to the prehistoric chapter Ooga Booga, a pretty big level that features a bunch of unique yet challenging segments all stringed together in a way that almost tells a story in and of itself. You'll ingratiate yourself with a bunch of cavemen, use them to infiltrate a club inhabited by rock creatures and owned by the mafia boss Don Weezo, and then you'll have to raise some cavemen to get your money back and then fight this giant named Bugga the Nut, and it's a lot of fun. 
However, it's at this point where the game begins to shift into tackling new gameplay styles that stray very far from the platforming of the first half, and also where the game nosedives in gameplay quality. It all starts with the spooky chapter, which introduces third-person shooting that honestly has not aged very well. When holding a gun, Conker can move and strafe, and the game includes a targeting laser for lighting up shots, but it's all very stiff, especially considering your targets are zombies that can only be killed by headshots, meaning you need to be super accurate. For the record, I was using a GameCube controller hooked into my console using an adapter, which feels a little more natural than an actual N64 controller, but it still doesn't feel quite right. I do like the bit where Conker turns into a bat and has to fetch villagers for an evil vampire squirrel, but the section afterwards where you have to fetch keys around the mansion is a tedious and arduous process. Then we come to It's War, which is certainly the biggest challenge yet, both because of the shooting controls and how hard the objectives are. Many of these sections are so tight and unforgiving that it makes this level very annoying to deal with. Getting the power back on isn't so bad, but once Conker is drafted and sent to a Teddy stronghold to clear it out, you have to deal with intense shooting segments where it's very easy for you to die if you aren't careful. You also have to drive this tank in certain parts in order to blow up this tower and then to fight a giant Teddy's experiment, and it doesn't control horribly, but it's just another mechanic that doesn't need to exist. And my god, the escape sequence. So I maxed out my life count to 99 in preparation for this level, and up through the experiment fight, I only lost about 12 to 15 lives. The escape section that follows, which mind you is just a 4 minute segment, is so brutal that I lost at least 40 lives here, especially the beach portion because these teddies with bazookas can annihilate you in an instant. It's certainly an epic chapter, and one that kinda takes the wind out of the final area, Heist, which is just one room where you partake in a Matrix parody that is pretty enjoyable, and the final boss, which I'll discuss later. Many of these levels are still really fun, even when the game experiments with mechanics that stray from the game's platforming roots. Yeah, the last third may be pretty bad, but everything else makes for a seriously captivating adventure, especially if you're familiar with similar platformers of the era and how they operate. The added touch of humor and the dialogue between characters lead to a ton of shocking moments that, as a result, are very memorable. Speaking of humor, let's take a look at how well the satire and mature jokes have held up over the years, which is important to do when you're dealing with a game based around comedy. Now humor is subjective, but from my perspective as someone who doesn't always find toilet humor funny, most of Conker still makes me laugh. I find the best humor comes when the game pokes fun at video game tropes and quirks by breaking the fourth wall as Conker and the other characters comment on what's going on. Meta-referential comedy is tricky because leaning too far against the fourth wall makes it more annoying rather than funny, and I find Conker finds the perfect balance between meta jokes and other types of humor. Bad Fur Day works best when it takes ideas you find in other games and confronts them like a firing squad to ask, hey, why do games do this? And it feels genuine too, the humor is cynical and quick-witted as you'd expect from British comedy, but it comes from a place of real passion and care for creating a product that you've never seen before. That's not to say that the humor is always cerebral, because the game does go for the low-hanging fruit quite often. Conker's Bad Fur Day is a dirty, ranted, and filthy game, and it relishes in showing off how vile it can be. And that's not a criticism for the record. I do believe that the crude humor, while it isn't always to my taste, does help make Bad Fur Day stick out among games of its system and its era. Conquer doesn't just show you a bunch of sex and violence, it places them in a context that makes those elements unexpected, and therefore comedic. Not every joke hits the mark, however, and some are just in too poor a taste to be considered funny 20 years later, in particular the sexual jokes. The Sunflower is often cited by Chris Seaver as a scene that he wouldn't do again, and I certainly find it one of the game's more troubling moments. But the worst has to be the Cogs, which, without talking about the scene in depth, is basically sexual assault played for laughs, and that's not okay. Bad Fur Day was made in a different time and it was not the only piece of media making jokes like this, but while that context is important, it is not an excuse, and it's crucial to recognize this when looking back on the game. Something else that doesn't quite hold up, thankfully for a much less worrying reason, are all the movie references. Bad Fur Day loves throwing in allusions to famous movies through both visual references and reciting famous lines and dialogue. 
Some are more timely than others, spoofing classic films like The Godfather, Jaws, The Wizard of Oz, and A Clockwork Orange. Others like Bram Stoker's Dracula, The Matrix, Godzilla 1998, and Saving Private Ryan seem more like parodying things that were popular at the time and become more noticeably dated. I do want to give credit to the Private Ryan parody though, although calling it that isn't even being accurate since it's not a spoof so much as it is a direct remake of the famous Normandy Beach scene. The attention to detail in getting this scene to match the one in the movie is astonishing, and in all honesty, it has a similar impact to Spielberg's film. But even though some of the humor is aged or uncomfortable now, the comedy in Bad Fur Day is still, on the whole, very fresh even 20 years later. The improvised dialogue definitely helps deliver a tighter punch since it feels less like a plot that's programmed to hit all the beats you expect it to. The game is best played with no knowledge of what happens beforehand, because having the joke spoiled for you dampens the experience. Consequently, Bad Fur Day is nowhere near as replayable as Rare's other games because the story bits take precedence over the gameplay, and once you know how they go, there's less incentive to go through it again. Thankfully, the game has a chapters feature that allows you to go back into any section so long as you've beaten it in a game file, which the developers added to let people show specific sections of the narrative to their friends. This makes it easier to go back to Bad Fur Day since you can pick and choose which areas you want to revisit and skip those you don't. Something else that makes it easier to revisit Conquer is the aesthetics because my god, Bad Fur Day is a phenomenal looking and sounding game. This was one of the last games released on the N64 and it shows how much this generation evolved in graphics and audio, especially since Rare made several N64 titles and had plenty of technical expertise by that time. The models feature plenty of detail in both the physical geometry and the high resolution textures that make the characters and objects pop. The famous Rareware cartoony art style is in full effect here, but even when the game goes for darker settings and areas, it still has that same charming look you've come to know the company for. The lighting especially gets a lot more dynamic in some areas, emphasizing the color and positioning that makes the light and shadows almost cinematic. The soundtrack was done by Robin Beanland, who previously helped create music for Donkey Kong Country, Killer Instinct, and Conker's Pocket Tales. In keeping with the game's evolving nature, Beanland goes for a number of different musical styles to suit the mood of the current area. That means that the soundtrack goes in many different directions, covering a multitude of genres and influences, but all of them strangely work. Some of my favorites include the aforementioned Windy, which is such a jaunty, cheerful melody that will never leave your head. The mariachi-influenced Olay that plays during the fight with the bull. The horror-themed Undead for when you escape the mansion in Spooky. And the techno song Rock Solid that plays in the titular club. And need I mention the Great Mighty Pooh song again? Major props to Chris Marlowe for bringing his opera training into a scene where he plays a giant piece of crap who threatens to ram you up his butt. But it isn't just the music that makes Bad Fur Day an auditory marvel, because there's also the game's full voice acting for the entire script. Chris Seaver voices all the male characters except for the Great Mighty Pooh, and animator Louise O'Connor voices all the female characters except for the Bee Queen and the Little Girl, who are both voiced by Seaver. It's not the first N64 game with full voice acting, and not even the first Rare game to have it, but it's still fascinating how well the voices sound on a cartridge, and yeah, it's compressed, but it's still remarkably clear. It's not just the actors putting on voices though, as Robin Beanland's audio engineering shifts the pitch and vocal quality to help mask the fact that there's only two main people doing the voices. The acting isn't necessarily good, it feels like a bunch of amateurs coming together, possibly drunk and just spewing whatever nonsense comes out of their head, but in a way that just kinda adds to the appeal of it. Even on a visual level, Bad Fur Day is technically a very impressive game. 
I've already commented on the high quality models, but the facial and body animations are also superb and every character is incredibly expressive. Conker also doesn't feature any distance fog and has such a huge draw distance that the environments seem massive, especially in Windy. Even minor effects like how the game renders fluids and motion blur show just how much Rare put into making the game look as nice as possible. And the best part is that Bad Fur Day doesn't require the N64 expansion pack, and there aren't any enhancements if the pack is installed either, meaning that all these achievements come from the 64 megabyte cartridge alone. Unfortunately, Conker's frame rate isn't always stellar, sometimes dipping slightly in intense areas, but it never becomes a problem that interferes with gameplay and doesn't detract from the game's amazing aesthetics. You know what else is amazing? The multiplayer. Bad Fur Day features several multiplayer modes with different objectives and themes, and each one brings its own sense of enjoyment and fun. Most are built around shooting, so you do have to be used to the main game for the multiplayer to be effective, but even if you don't have a friend who's played the game, playing against a computer is a good alternative. You have your standard deathmatch mode, where you have to grab weapons and kill all your opponents before they do the same to you, which is exciting, but it suffers from a lack of unique maps. I think there's only one that you can't play in any of the other modes. For team-based deathmatches, there's two modes to choose from, both of which take place during the war between the squirrels and the teddies. Total War is a standard team deathmatch map with the addition of a chemical weapon that can wipe out anyone not within a safe zone or not wearing a gas mask. Colors is a capture the flag mode where in addition to killing enemies, you earn points for grabbing the enemy's flag and bringing it back to your base. Honestly, these modes aren't that great when it's just you and one computer like I played it, it's better to just play these maps through the normal deathmatch mode with more players. Beach is an interesting game, as you can play as either a French squirrel refugee trying to escape via allied van, or a teddy soldier trying to stop them. The Frenchies are basically defenseless, as their only offensive option is a TNT plunger in the middle of the map, which exposes them to enemy fire, but kills every single teddies at once. Conversely, the teddies are restricted to a small section of the map and have access to massive firepower, but all of it is long range, making it an interesting balance between the two sides. The tank mode, as the name implies, places every player in control of a tank, and your goal is to grab a chemical canister and bring it back to your base, which sets off a weapon that kills anyone left outside the main area. This mode's not bad, but the tank controls really aren't designed for snappy multiplayer action, which makes this mode underwhelming. Race suffers from the same fate, especially since it just takes the racetrack from Ooga Booga and slaps it in here. I enjoy the hoverboard racing, but this mode needs more unique tracks to be worth playing, as just one track in forward and reverse isn't enough. In Raptor, you take control of either a caveman gathering dinosaur eggs and bringing them to their frying pan, or a raptor defending the eggs and bringing cavemen back to their hungry baby. I find that this mode is heavily unbalanced against the cavemen, as it's too easy for the raptors to kill an opponent, and the caveman can't attack while they're carrying an egg, so they have fewer opportunities to strike. Finally, there's my absolute favorite game mode, Heist, where you play as one of four weasels robbing a bank for Don Weasel, but it's not a cooperative break-in. Inside the vault, it's every weasel for themselves. This mode gets really intense when everyone rushes to get the cash in the center of the map, and bringing the money back to your exit while everyone else tries to shoot you is nerve-wracking in the most awesome way possible. Honestly, the developers didn't need to try to make the multiplayer mode this rich with exceptional content, but it gives Bad Fur Day a sense of longevity that feels missing from most of the other Rare N64 games. Anyway, let's finally now talk about the game's narrative and the ending. Bad Fur Day really doesn't have an overarching story, instead it focuses on the individual situations and storylines of each area, telling a number of condensed tales rather than a unified plot unfolding throughout the game. That makes the whole concept of the game's massive adventures all taking place on one day all the better, because it makes the story feel like it's progressing at a wonderfully fast rate. And through most of the game, it's clear that the designers did not take this story seriously at all. If the basic idea and the dialogue you've seen on screen didn't already clue you in, Bad Fur Day does not care about its plot. Every cutscene features a cynical, nonsensical tone that permeates the foundation of each part of the story, making it feel appropriately silly. That changes when you get to It's War, which for the most part plays the scenario straight as it shows the horrors of war in a mostly realistic manner. 
There are some jokes here and there, but many sections are downright brutal to look at, and the only thing that makes me take it less seriously is that it's a war between squirrels and teddy bears. Then, after coming back from the Teddy stronghold and finding the windmill destroyed, Conker makes it to the Federal Reserve Bank, meeting up again with Don Weasel and Barry. Don Weasel enlists Conker and Barry to rob the bank, which they do via a Matrix parody because everything in the early 2000s parodied the Matrix. Once the two make it into the vault and Conker grabs enough money to become a millionaire, he finds that the vault is actually a spaceship and finally meets the Panther King and Professor Von Krippelspack. He also learns that Don Weasel is working for the Panther King to bring Conker to him, and on the King's orders, Weasel kills Barry after she stands up to the two of them, and she dies gruesomely in Conker's arms. As if that wasn't enough, the Panther King begins convulsing in his seat, which apparently the Professor was expecting. Suddenly, Alien. Yes, a creature named Heinrich bursts out of the Panther King's chest in a not at all subtle reference to the movie Alien, I mean, this is clearly just a xenomorph, apparently planted into the King by the Professor as a means to kill him and Conker at the same time. When the Professor brings the spaceship into orbit, Conker opens up the airlock, which sends Barry and the Panther King's corpses flying out into space, alongside the Professor who loses control of his mechanical chair. Conker enters a robotic suit in yet another alien reference and fights Heinrich head-on for the final boss battle, which honestly is not great. You have to knock Heinrich out and then grab his tail, spin him around, and toss him out the airlock, much like Super Mario 64. But it's nearly impossible to get the alien to swing around just by rotating the control stick because the speed you need to rotate the stick at seems incredibly precise to maintain. It's not the GameCube adapter either, I tried this with an actual N64 controller and that didn't make it any better. Thankfully, I learned about an alternate method where you rotate the camera and hold one direction down, which allows you to get a good spin going before you stop rotating the camera and line up your shot. After throwing Heinrich out of the airlock enough times, the alien prepares to deliver a final strike to Conker when, all of a sudden, the game crashes, with only Conker still awake and aware of what's happening. Conker manages to get in touch with a game programmer who helps him defeat the alien once and for all by chopping his head off with a katana. Now that he's back in the throne room, Conker is joined by the characters he met in the game, who declare him the new king now that the Panther King is dead, which Conker objects to. In the middle of this, Conker realizes that he didn't bring Barry back to life and tries to reach out to the programmer, but they've already left and the others place him on the throne despite his protests. Conker delivers another narration lamenting that he can't go back home with Barry and is stuck in a position of leadership that he doesn't want, and realizes too late that he didn't appreciate what he had until it was gone. Later, we see Conker at the same bar he started the game in, drinking his sorrows away, and then stumbling outside and heading in the opposite direction as he did that night this all started, ending Conker's bad fur day. For 90% of the game, it's a quirky, weird, and wholeheartedly immature experience that forgoes any serious message in favor of telling jokes. But the ending of Bad Fur Day is shockingly bitter and depressing, marking a complete mood whiplash from the rest of the story that is so out of left field that it almost seems brilliant by design. I don't know how much stock Chris Seaver wanted us to put into this ending, or whether or not the fact that it's so serious and downtrodden is just another joke, but regardless, I do find this ending genuinely poignant. The game could have easily ended with some silly, rushed finale that is as comical and unimportant as the rest of it, but instead, the designers made something completely creative and original, and I love it for that. Really though, that's how I feel about Conker's Bad Fur Day as a whole. It's an absolutely iconic, authentic, and hilariously offbeat piece of work. It may not always have the tightest gameplay, and some aspects have aged like milk, but you can't deny the pure inventiveness on display here. This is the type of game you get when you give designers complete freedom to do what they want regardless of corporate interference, and it's super uncommon to see a game like that come out. I may not like playing it as much as I do Banjo because of the sometimes awkward design and stiffer controls, but there's a reason why many Rare fans list this as their favorite game from the studio, even 20 years later. The developers took what probably would have been a forgotten platformer and retooled it into something bizarre, raunchy, and wholeheartedly unique, and that's something to admire even if it doesn't always nail the execution. So that just leaves one question. Where would Conquer go from here?
Sometime after Bad Fur Day's release, Rare began work on a sequel tentatively titled Conker's Other Bad Day, which was under development for the Nintendo GameCube. The game was to pick up after Bad Fur Day with Conker still in the position of king but having wasted all the treasury's money on partying and alcohol, and he would be thrown into the dungeon to start another quest. Thanks to photos of a design document posted by Chris Seaver on Twitter, we have a glimpse into some of the concepts that would have made it into the game, such as movable contact sensitive pads and the return and resurrection of Barry and the Panther King. Unfortunately, this game would never come to be, as a huge change was about to happen at Rare. Rare was bought by Microsoft in 2002, and all of the company's games in progress were either retooled for the Xbox or were cancelled, and the latter was the fate that befell Conker's other bad day. Apparently, Microsoft wasn't interested in creating a sequel to Bad Fur Day and thus shut down the project, which at that point only consisted of concept art and design ideas and hadn't started serious development. However, Microsoft would release a Conquer game on the Xbox, but instead of a brand new title, they would instead remake Bad Fur Day and deliver a brand new multiplayer experience for Xbox Live. The game was released in 2005 as Conquer Live and Reloaded, so let's take a look at this version and see how it stacks up to the original. Live and Reloaded features a mostly faithful recreation of the story mode in Bad Fur Day, with alterations here and there to address some of the problems of the original and drastically overhaul the combat. Instead of a frying pan, Conquer now uses a baseball bat, which the designers apparently wanted for the original game, but decided against it because frying pans make a funnier sound when hit. But in Live and Reloaded, taking the baseball bat out transitions Conquer into the third-person shooting controls, which feel a lot more modern. Most enemies won't go down in just a single hit, and you need to perform a combo maneuver to deal damage, which requires good timing to get down. Because of this, however, the designers added more enemies to the world, usually these spiky guys, that will get in your way unless you eliminate them, and frankly, I just don't see why this change was added. It doesn't bring anything useful or interesting to the table, it just makes what were previously easy sections to get around more tedious. I want to say Conquer controls better overall, but there are some things that make it less than ideal sometimes. For some reason, pushing the left stick acts as a jump button, making accidental jumps when you're moving the camera around not uncommon. The swimming and flying controls are weird, since you use the left stick to move and the right stick to influence direction, with two buttons on the controller for ascending and descending. It should feel smoother, but because the camera movement is pretty slow, it becomes less comfortable to use in tight spaces, though thankfully Conker has much more air this time around, so swimming sections aren't broken. The shooting controls are much better, with proper movement and aiming that makes the spooky and its war chapters easier, even considering how many more enemies are in these maps compared to the originals. And this is a weird sentence, but in the Xbox version, it's easier to pee than it is on the N64 version. I'll just leave it at that. A handful of puzzles are redesigned with quality of life improvements to make the game less punishing. For instance, one of the bee swarms you need for the Sunflower is in a less dangerous location, the Teddy's Machine Gunner has been removed entirely, and this section with the fans, which is notoriously difficult on the N64, has added textures to make judging where the blades are simpler. Fixed cameras are removed entirely, which makes Bat's Tower less frustrating, but the camera sometimes gets stuck on objects and geometry. It's also now possible to actually rotate and throw Heinrich this time around, though the camera spinning method doesn't work here. And I only died three times in the live and reloaded version of the escape sequence in It's War, although for whatever reason I had a much more miserable time with the tower section than I did before. Bad Fur Day on the N64 looked incredible for the time it was released, but unfortunately I can't quite say the same about Live and Reloaded. Not that the game looks bad, because it certainly doesn't. In fact, if we're just talking about visual fidelity, the models and environments look fantastic, still maintaining a cartoony vibe while upscaling the polygon count. My problems come from the technical aspects that give way to graphical shortcomings which distract from the game overall. The animations look stiffer and more robotic in this version, mostly since they're using Bad Fur Day's animations as a base and they don't translate perfectly to the newer hardware. Facial animations in particular look very unpolished, never being as expressive as they were in the N64 game, which leads to interactions losing their impact because characters don't look as invested this time around. I do like how Conker wears full costumes in Spooky and It's War now, and I especially love the Van Helsing outfit worn when you're fighting zombies. 
On the audio side of things, Live and Reloaded replaced the synthesized music with live renditions of the classic tunes, which all sound really good. The music translates very well to an actual orchestra, though I find that the audio mixing isn't as balanced here because it's playing CD-based audio rather than MIDI compositions. However, the voice acting definitely suffered some hiccups when the developers recorded the new lines for explaining controls for the Xbox controller and adding some new content. The game features uncompressed voice clips from the original, but whenever there's new dialogue, it sounds like either Chris Seaver forgot how to do the voices, or not enough audio processing was done to get them to match, especially when played back to back. If you think you're coming this way, you can think again. A frying pan. You stupid little t And of course, there's the most controversial aspect of Live and Reloaded that caused a big stir in the Conquer fanbase at its launch, the censorship. The game was originally titled Conquer Live and Uncut, and Rare was aiming to develop a completely uncensored single-player experience. However, somewhere along the line, that was dropped and Live and Reloaded instead featured more censorship than the N64 version. For context, in the original game, only fuck and occasionally shit were bleeped out, but otherwise all the swears were left intact. On Live and Reloaded, however, many more curses are bleeped, which confused people because the general assumption was that a game on a Microsoft platform would be less censored than one for a Nintendo console. But is this censorship really that big of an issue? To be honest, I don't think so. It should be stressed that no content is removed, the only censorship happening is the beeping of more swear words, which in and of itself isn't really enough to get angry over. Sometimes it does get in the way, such as completely ruining the fellatio joke in Ooga Booga, but instances like that are few and far between. And while the language was toned down, the level of violence is actually increased thanks to the better blood and gore effects. The N64 version was bloody, sure, but the viscera models and textures are much more grisly here, and the game even extends some scenes to make them more graphic, such as Barry's death, the soldier execution scene, and the electric chair cutscene, which actually gets pretty disturbing. I'm not saying that I'm in favor of the censorship or that it makes the game better, but I do think a lot of the criticism of it is overblown, and it's not even the game's biggest problem. I feel like the gameplay changes are a much more important criticism, honestly. But let's talk about what I believe to be the real reason Live and Reloaded exists, the multiplayer. The game replaced the N64 game's multiplayer modes with a brand new multiplayer option called Xbox Live and Company. Rather than have a multitude of genres and game modes to choose from, this multiplayer focuses squarely on team-based third-person shooting, taking place during the war between the Squirrels and the Teddies. You can play as a number of different classes with unique weapons and abilities, each with their own strategy that can alter the flow of battle. Maps are designed around specific objectives. In one, for example, the squirrels need to push up a beach and destroy barricades to win, while the teddies have to stop them in their tracks. It's all standard stuff, and forgive me if I don't go too deep into the multiplayer, but the servers for the original Xbox have long been shut down, and it doesn't feel right to review an online multiplayer game that I can't play with real people anymore. There are some single player options, as you can play through a campaign mode or start a local match where you go up against AI opponents. I played a few rounds of these and it was enjoyable, but nothing I felt the need to spend that much time on. Something tells me that Rare and Microsoft wanted to push a Conquer multiplayer game, but felt that that wasn't enough to justify a full release, so they tacked on a remake of the original to boost sales and add content. I have no evidence to support that, it's just a theory, but it makes sense especially since multiplayer is the default menu option, not the story mode. All in all, I wouldn't call Live and Reloaded a bad way to play through Bad Fur Day, graphical concerns and added bleeps aside. It's probably going to appeal more to you if you can't get past the outdated controls and movement of the N64 game, but I personally would still recommend the original version over this one any day of the week. But after Live and Reloaded's release in 2005, Conquer just sort of disappeared off the face of the earth. As Rare transitioned towards exclusive development for the Xbox Kinect, many of their famous franchises were left in the dust, Conquer included. There was another Conquer multiplayer game being designed, tentatively titled Conquer Getting Medieval, which would shift the Squirrel's Teddy's War to a fantasy setting and would only include Conquer as a guest character. We know very little about this game as it was cancelled too early in development for any real progress to be made, though Rare did share some concept art that shows what the characters would have looked like. 
From here, Conker would only make sporadic appearances in various projects, none of which pleased fans in the slightest. First, there was Conker's Big Reunion, an add-on pack for Microsoft's short-lived video game creation tool Project Spark that was released in April 2015, ten years after Live and Reloaded. It wasn't developed by any of the former Conker team, though Chris Seaver did return to voice Conker and Birdie. This was meant to be the first in a series of episodic releases that would continue the Conker story, but only one episode was produced and released before Microsoft shut Project Spark down in 2016. Users of the tool were also given the Conker's Big Reunion assets alongside the game, letting people create their own Conker adventures, a nifty idea which I'm sure pleased someone, right? I can't play Conker's Big Reunion myself since the project is shut down, but just from watching the gameplay, I'm kinda thankful for that. It feels more like a weird mishmash of gameplay ideas, some copied from Bad Fur Day, references to Conker's previous adventures that just remind you of when the series was good, and movie and video game parodies which, admittedly, I thought were okay. The game is nothing to write home about, and it feels more like a cash grab than a serious attempt at reviving a dying franchise. But if Conker's big reunion left a sour taste in the mouths of Conker fans, then Young Conker burned them entirely. Young Conquer is an application for the Microsoft HoloLens, a pair of augmented reality glasses that launched in 2016. The app centers around a young version of Conquer who can interact with objects in your home via an AR interface. And wow, people were revolted by this thing. You can probably already see why, but watching Conquer reduced to the status of a gimmicky distraction like this, coupled with it lacking any semblance of the humor of previous games, was devastating for fans. There are claims that Young Conquer ruined the franchise, but the thing is, even if you want the original developers and company to create a new Conquer game, it's not going to happen. Many Bad Fur Day developers left Rare years ago, including Chris Seaver and Sean Pyle, who went on to form indie studio Gory Detail. These guys have produced two games so far, Parachute Stan and the unlikely legend of Rusty Pup, and are currently working on a third project that is described as the spiritual successor to Bad Fur Day. Before you get excited, Seaver has clarified that it will not be a more direct successor like Ukulele was to Banjo-Kazooie. Instead, it will feature the same vibe and essence as Bad Fur Day while also taking inspiration from the cancelled game Urchin, which the Live and Reloaded team was working on for the Xbox 360. As for Rare, they've been pumping out content for Sea of Thieves as of late and are currently at work on a new game called Everwild and have shown no indication of heading back to classic franchises for the time being. I can't see them tackling a new Conquer game anytime soon, and even if they did, I doubt it would be the Bad Fur Day follow-up that people want, but something completely different that likely wouldn't please fans. Even Chris Seaver wouldn't be the right person for the job, as he said himself in interviews over the years. Seaver has acknowledged that if he made a Conquer game today, it wouldn't be what fans would want because his attitude and sense of humor has changed since Bad Fur Day's release, and he's expressed embarrassment over some of the stuff he put into the game. So, where does that leave Conker? Well, as much as I hate to admit it, I don't see him coming back anytime soon, at least not in the form that we love him for. Conker's Bad Fur Day is such a unique blend of elements that might have barely worked together without the proper people making the game, and the ones who created it then can't do it justice now. But you know, maybe that's for the best. Bad Fur Day is a game that's almost unfathomable in terms of concept and execution, and considering everything, it's a miracle that the game came out as polished and well-crafted as it did. It's such a perfect mix of platforming action, mature humor, eye-catching visuals, and biting pastiche that it's nearly impossible to imitate, and following up on a game like this would be a daunting challenge indeed. I'm not saying it couldn't be done, but Bad Fur Day has such a crazy legacy that trying to live up to it would make for an insane amount of pressure. And even considering all of that, this game is emblematic of its time and just wouldn't work as well in a more modern setting. Bad Fur Day is largely a parody of 3D collectathon platformers, which were popular in 2001 but aren't as prevalent as they used to be, and even if it was released just five years later, a lot of it would be lost on people. In many ways, the game symbolizes the era it was made, a cultural time capsule that is fascinating to study, but is also locked firmly in the past. But that's why looking back on it is so much fun, because it shows why the people who grew up with this console generation, like myself, fell in love with video games to begin with. And for a game about a drunk, lazy squirrel who messes up the lives of everyone he comes across, that's quite an accomplishment indeed.
Hey, just in case you haven't joined the Cloud Connection Discord server yet, you should check it out. The link's in the description.